Okay, we are live. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. I have with me the Gala Sisters, which is, which is Rachel and Rhea Gala. Is that right? The last name is Gala, right? Galarno. What? Oh, Galarno. Okay. We so it's the Galarno it. Sisters. Yeah, we shortened it because it's hard to say and spell. <laughs> Well, you guys have a, a hilarious channel. I love watching your videos because of the dynamics between the two of you. You guys are so funny. And for my subscribers, I did an interview on the Gala Sisters channel. It must have been about a week ago now, right? Yeah. And that interview was all about Scientology and the Danny Masterson case. So um, in, in the description, like once this live stream is done, uh, I'll put the, the link to that specific interview video in the description down below, but you guys can find it just by going over to the Gala Sisters YouTube channel. So while we were doing the interview last week, you guys mentioned something about the Freemasons and you said, oh, we should talk about the Freemasons sometime because you guys, and I don't want to butcher this, uh, but you guys have a lot of personal experience with the organization. Why don't I leave it to you guys to explain what your um membership or lack thereof is in that organization. I'm going to butcher it if I try to explain it. You want to start because yours is much shorter. Uh, so we are members of Eastern Star. We're currently inactive just because of life and everything shutting down, etc. cetera. Um, basically, Eastern Star is a division of Freemasonry that includes women because in the United States, you can't be a Mason if you're a woman. So I held the position as warder. Um, when we were active and I've been a member for like three years. I think something like that. Okay. Mine's a little more complicated. So I'm 38 years old. I just turned 38 in October. Um, I joined rainbow, which is the, one of the three junior organizations. There are three, there is Demo way, which was founded in 1919. There's Job's daughters, which was founded in, in 1920. And there's rainbow that's founded in 1922. Now, I know more about Rainbow than I do about anything else. Rainbow was actually founded by a reverend, Mark W. Sexton, S-E-X-T-O-N. Um, he was a 33rd degree Mason, and we'll get to the degrees in a minute. But I have a lot of past titles. Back in the day, before all the fun happened, there was a Rainbow Assembly. Now, they're called assemblies, chapters, lodges. They all have different names. Can I ask you a question real quick? When you say junior organization, does that mean an organization for younger people or just uh, uh, yeah. organizations that are less senior than it's just for younger people yes they're for, okay for children. rainbow is 10 to 20 joby's is 10 to tw job's daughters is 10 to 20 and demo lay is 12 to 21 oh okay okay I i'm following you now so i have lots of past grand titles i am a past worthy advisor which is the person who runs the meeting in rainbow i held that position in 2001 where i got my gavel that our mom and dad gave us because they're really cool. I got there from Things Remembered. I am also a past grand representative to Kentucky, Mississippi, Indiana, North Dakota, and the Philippines, Guam, which means it was my job to be pen pals with other states and other jurisdictions, which is what Rainbow is. I am also a past grand nature, an honor that I share with former Chief Justice uh, Sandra Day O'Connor. She's also a past grand nature. I also am a past grand choir director, which means it was my job to put out all the music. And that was really scary. I am also a past outer observer, which is the person who does, who greets all the new initiates and she explains to them. Um, Rainbow was written in a, I think the ritual was written in a single afternoon. Um, Reverend Sexton wrote it and he was like, hey, look, I'm gonna write this in a single afternoon because in the day, Joby's, Job's daughters, I have to get used to calling them Job's daughters, um, were, for people, were for children of Masons. That was the only thing they could be. And that is rule has since changed, but in my day, um, and Rainbow was for anyone. I had a friend when I was in seventh grade who was a member of Rainbow who since has long since been defunct in the organization. I continued on till I took my majority in 2005, I think it was in 2005-ish. Yeah. And I has still had done some things with them as an adult. However, Rainbow is no longer, sadly, in Minnesota anymore because like everything else that you're going to see, uh, the organization membership has dwindled. Okay. Yeah. So I'll tell you, one of the reasons I have, um, well, really wanted to discuss this, aside from the fact that I just don't know anything about it, is that in Scientology, 
there is a bit of an infatuation with certain conspiracy theories. And it's weird because this has become sort of a cultural part of Scientology. Like L. Ron Hubbard uh, just sort of casually offhandedly mentions, uh, you know, some conspiracy theories. You could call Scientology itself sort of a conspiracy theory. But in the culture of Scientology, there's a lot about uh, the bankers, which is funny because there's usually a, like sort of an anti-Semitic connotation to talking about the bankers. Scientologists managed to talk about the world bankers without getting into the anti-Semitic territory of it. But you've got the bankers. I guess you've sort of got the Illuminati and you've got the Freemasons. And, and where this fits into the Scientology uh, conspiracy culture is just that there's these these forces, these unseen forces working behind the scenes with the bankers and the psychiatrists to essentially control all of human civilization. And it is these evil forces who are threatened by the existence of Scientology and all the attacks in the media and all this are basically essentially funded by these hidden forces. And Freemasonry sort of, you know, just kind of in an unspecified way factors into that conspiracy theory. And, and it's, again, it's something Scientologists talk about, even though L. Ron Hubbard himself uh, didn't really get into it. Not and really. so, it, it, and what I've run into when I try to study up on Freemasonry is I imagine what a lot of people run into when they try to study up on Scientology. No matter how much they read, they sort of go, yeah, I don't get it. <laughs> and that's, that's where I'm at. I, I watched some videos uh, recently, put some questions together, but at the, I fundamentally just don't get it. I don't get the purpose of the organization. I don't get the levels. I don't get what the point is. H how would you give like the elevator pitch description of the whole thing? Well, first of all, they're called degrees. And may I share something really cool? You know how in colloquial English, we always say, I'm going to get mad at you. I'm going to give you the third degree. Did you know that there is a Masonic history to that? A third degree Mason. That is Masonic. That is somehow found its way into popular culture. I don't know why or how. Yeah, that's true. And probably some of the conspiracy theories come from the fact that many of America's founding fathers were Masons, like George Washington was. Yes. And many others. And so their hands are in the creating of our country. And Part of the reason why they have some positive um, influence on them is because, you know, we won the war and we were able to free ourselves from uh, Britain and et cetera. But one of the biggest conspiracy theories is that the Masons have poisoned the water. That is not true. And are trying to influence everyone and permeate politics and take over. And that's just not true. Basically, Masons, yes, there is secret on, work. Hold on, sorry, kid is being loud. <laughs> um, there is secret work, you know, that it, it is accessible to the public just because of over time from people leaving and from it being exposed or whatever. It's not anything crazy, though. To, but what it is, basically, charitable works. Yes. What masonry is, is there are actually, before you get through much of anything, there are three degrees of masonry that you have to pass through to be able to be a man. From there, you can join like the Knights Templar, which I know very little about. You could join um, the Scottish Rite. Again, don't know much about it. You can join, you know, as a guy, you can join Eastern Star or Order of the Amaranth, which is the other order that has both men and women. Um, and you can also um, join Shriners. If you guys know what the Shriners are, those are 32nd degree Masons and the honorary degree is the 33rd. There was a internet uh, I think it was an interview with someone said there's a 93rd degree Mason. There is no such thing. Well, so, and do you know what the Shriners uh, Hospital is? Well, I'm at least familiar with it, but it's one of those things where I go, other than it being a hospital, you know, you try to look up the Shriners and I go, I'm sorry, I don't get it. So the Shriners is would you, yes. part of Freemasonry. Yes. You have to be a third degree Mason to be able to be a Shriner. I thought you said they were the 32nd degree. They are. <laughs> there's a lot of different degrees and it gets really confusing because you don't go one, two, three, you go one, two, three, and then you can do whatever you want after that. Yeah. Oh, that's a, that's a big one. Okay. I was very confused about that for years until um, <laughs> it past state. What is it? What is it? State, not master counselors. Called? When brother, we'll just say this. When brother Charles Ward explained it to me. Yes. We do call each other brother and sister. <clears throat> 
if there is a Our, former member of each, there's a member of each from star around me, I will say sister this, brother that. A lot of the conspiracy theories probably come from the fact that Aleister Crowley was a Mason. Aleister Crowley. Yeah. So um, are there names or titles associated with each degree? Yes, but I don't remember what they all are anymore. It's been a long time. But See, that, that, that makes it additionally confusing. So there's yeah, multiple yeah. ways to refer to a single, uh, multiple ways to, to refer to a single yes. thing. Um, okay, so when someone says, well, it's really all about charity work, I, I go, well, you don't need, you can just do charity work. You don't need to be or do, you don't need to be anything to do charity work. And so like, what is the purpose? Like, okay, Scientology volunteer ministers, a Scientologist might go, well, being a volunteer minister is all about helping people. And you go, yeah, okay, but you don't have to be a Scientology volunteer minister to help people. So the cynical interpretation or what I would call the real interpretation is that the volunteer ministers just exist to create good press for Scientology. That's it. Like it's not about anything other than creating good press for Scientology. Um, wh what's the argument? What's the pitch? What's the argument for why this organization adds value? What's the value of the organization beyond what any other organization could do? Well, I mean, you have to talk about the trainer's hospital there. Oh, okay. Usually if you have a sick child, you have to pay to get health care. But if you have a sick child, you can bring them to the Shriners Hospital and get free health care. Mm -hmm. We actually, we have a huge Shriners Hospital here in uh, Clearwater, Tampa. Mm -hmm. Like driving, driving right over to Tampa, there's a giant Shriners Hospital. Is that what it is? It's a, it's a free, it's a free children's hospital? Yes. Yep. Okay. I think it used to be that you had to fit certain qualifications. But if I remember from what Brother Charles Ward told us, um, anybody can go as long as they fit certain requirements now. Like it's like different, like loosen the requirements quite a bit. There's also Masonic retirement homes too, which are specifically for members of the Freemasonry community, whether they be Amaranth, Eastern Star, or Masons. Amaranth, I don't know much about. I just know that it's another thing. I know that it, it's very, it's different, but it's the same. And that's something that I could not answer for you. But okay, so in your opinion, why is it called a secret society? What makes Freemasonry a secret society? I think that part of it is the fact that it makes it more alluring. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that also part of it too was that it was created around a time when churches had huge impacts on society. And I'm, I'm talking about like all churches, like Abraham religions and stuff like that had infiltrated um, government and it was just common in dictated society. And a lot of the ideas and philosophy presented in Freemasonry don't always line up with religion. So they're able to kind of separate themselves from that. However, you do not have to be a member of a certain religion to be a Freemason. You can still have your religious beliefs and still go to church or whatever you want to on the side. You're not required to be a part of any religion or anything like that. The only thing you're required to do is believe in a higher power, we, not God, a higher power. We know a Luciferian who's a Mason, actually. He's a very good friend of ours. I'm not going to reveal who he is because I don't know if he'd want that. But And, you know, you just kneel at this altar and they say, okay, which book, which book of the Bible, which, you know, holy book do you want? And so just, do do you um, do you bristle a bit when it's described as a secret society or is that an do you consider it to be a secret society? It's it's not as secret as you might think. The thing is that I mean, well, whatever that might mean, like like when I was in Scientology, um, I would bristle at Scientology being called a secretive organization because as a relatively lower level member, I was like, don't you guys realize that we want everyone to become a Scientologist? How it, how is that secretive? How is that secretive? Like our job is to get as many people into Scientology every day of the week. That's not secretive. And yet I understand uh, because the upper levels are confidential. That's why it's called secretive. Right. But I would still bristle at the idea of it being described as secretive. Cause I'm like, it's not a club. We want the whole world to become members. <laughs> Here's this. I've heard this. I've heard it described this way many times. And, and so, but for you guys, do you think secret society is an accurate description for Freemasons? I think there's some yes and some no, because 
it's a secret, yes, but what they stand for is not a secret. Is basically, like we like to say, love and service. I was in rainbow, and in rainbow, there are seven colors of the rainbow, like the Roji bit. However, they, they were different things. Red was love. Green was religion. Yellow was nature. Green is immortality. Blue is fidelity. Indigo is patriotism. And violet is service. That is by design because rainbows and all these other guys are love and service. I have found that love and service are not that different from each other. Like in order to be a service, you have to love someone or love someone, you have to give them a service. You know what I mean? Like they're kind of like one and the same. Yes, they do talk about the Bible a lot in these, but it's nothing secrecy. I mean, there's nothing really that secret about it. I mean, I think the secret work might even be online somewhere. If you really could. Well, tell Just, me, where does the secretive aspect come from? There has to be a reason why it's viewed that way. There are secret like um, books with rituals in them. And a huge part of at least Eastern Star, which we've gone through and many of the rituals. Too. Yeah, and in Rainbow is talk a lot about Robert's rules of orders. So what we end up doing is doing a lot of like mock government procedures, uh, voting and memorizing a passage and reciting it and stuff like that. And just walking around a room to different points and stuff like that. And that's, that's really only secret part of it. I mean, yeah, you know, like secret um, things that we say to each other, but, but it would be no different than that of a college like fraternity or sorority. Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, I think there was a question. Oh, okay. So kind of like I said, there's this secretive aspect of Scientology in the fact that the upper levels are confidential. At the lower levels, they want everyone in the world to become a member. Do the Freemasons, I imagine they don't have that same approach of, yeah, we want everyone to be a Freemason. It, it is, well, it's, I'm trying to ask a question instead of make a statement here. <laughs> Do the Masons want to recruit as many members as possible or do they want to keep it limited? You know, with the invention of the way things are and the fact that lodges have dwindled down from hundred thousands to probably thousands, I don't think they care as much, but we're going to share something else with you. You guys all, who all know who Adolf Hitler is, right? All of you guys know who that is. Did you know that there was another person that he persecuted and those were the Masons and the people who are members of the Masonic fraternities? They were forced to wear red squares. Then we become down to the forget-me-nots, mm -hmm. which is a secret way of saying that I'm here for you and I'll always be here for you. The forget-me-nots has become a very important symbol to Freemasonry in general. Like if we meet someone, we will give them a forget-me-not pin, like lapel pin. Like we have a whole bunch of them in this house and we just give them people because it's our way of saying we love you. And that's not a secret. You know, it's, it's not. You know. Well, in answer to your question about recruitment, of course there's recruitment as there is in any fraternal organization. And I mean, even colleges send around representatives to high schools trying to recruit people to go to school there. I mean, recruitment isn't necessarily bad, but not just anybody can become a Freemason. There are certain qualifications you have to go through, like, to join Eastern Star, you have to be related to a Mason. Or you can do what I did, and you can be a majority member of one of the junior organizations. In this case, Job's Daughters or Rainbow. Yeah. So it's not like anyone can just waltz right in and join. They're in the process of trying to change that, but it never goes through. No, it hasn't yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, there is a video I watched earlier today that said something that to me resonated because, well, because uh, it's true for Scientology, which is that at the lower level of Scientology, you could talk to them and they would give you a, a certain description of Scientology and they would be 100% confident that how what they're describing and how they're describing it is 100% true. And if you tried to talk to them about the upper levels or whatever, they would 100% deny it and they would totally believe that their knowledge is the true and complete version of the truth. And this guy said something similar about Freemasonry that at the lower uh, levels or grades, what did you call it? What was the word? Grade? Degrees. 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 At the lower degrees, you don't actually know what you don't know. And I'm wondering what your take on that is. Well, I'm a second degree rainbow girl because I have another honor that I didn't talk about because I was waiting for about degrees. 
I have an honor called the Grand Cross of Color, which is given to girls who show, and I guess some adults who show outstanding exemplary service awards and things like that and things that I did, things that I've shown, initiative that I had taken upon myself um, to be able to do. And so it's a very honored, supreme honor. My name is actually in the Masonic Temple in McAllister, Oklahoma, which is where Rainbow is headquartered. And there's like, it says Rhea Galarno. Yes, I've been married. Yes, I've changed my name. I've since changed my name back when I got to Boris because I don't want his last name. And it was just a very cool honor. And, you know, I think that looking at the degrees, like you don't know what it's all about, but they're all stand for three things. Those are lo those are uh, faith, hope, and charity, which are the three main line officers before you get, you have to go through the line. You go from faith to charity, to hope, to worthy advisor, to worthy to worthy associate advisor to worthy advisor. And that's just how it is. Like, and you have to strive to be, you know, like a more poised person. People always look at me and they say, excuse me, where did you learn your poise from? Oh, I learned my poise from Rainbow. That's where I learned it from. It was essentially kind of like taking cotillion, I would say. Mm, yeah. And, you know, the degrees, like you don't know everything about the degrees, but you know, basically what they stand for. You know that you're going to have callbacks to other organizations and other organizations. You know, like if you look at like immortality or you look at Martha, which is one of the star points in um, Eastern Star, the lectures are almost identical. Well, and being an Eastern Star, we know what is going on with um, the people at the top, if you the want to call them. Yeah. The that where we were just she was a star point, which is and I was, I was a warder. I was Queen Esther. And then we would have other positions that would be higher ranking positions. Like the worthy matron and worthy patron. Exactly. But we still, like, we know how much they spent on rent for the building and we vote on whether or not we're going to pay it mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So we were privy to all of that knowledge and included on all the emails and everything like that. And there wasn't anything that was kept from us. There weren't secret meetings that were going on. We're invited to all the meetings if we wanted to go to them. I mean, they didn't hold anything against us. We're all treated like adults. There's a huge thing that I think we need to talk about too. Like, well, what is a cult? And we talked about this a little well, bit. Well, I mean, I don't consider, do you say that because people think the Freemasons are a cult? Well, we get it a lot. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I mean, I don't personally... Uh, I've never personally given it enough thought to think of it that way. Um, Cause I don't, I mean, anything can be culty or cult like uh, anything can sort of some, you can have one thing that has a bunch of different believers, but they don't all treat it. They don't all think of it as a cult, but some of them, you know, like, and also it can become different as you get more experience in the organization. Yeah. But let, but let me ask you this. Does the uh, Eastern star, is that what you said is the sister organization? Mm -hmm. Does it have the exact same level of degrees as the mm -hmm. Freemason, as the Masons? No, no. Um, actually, okay. a long, long, long time ago, previous to the 1950s, um, the initiation would take days. Now the initiation takes what? An hour and a half, mm -hmm. two hours? Because they short, they truncated the ritual. And over time, rituals have changed. Like the rainbow ritual is very different than it was back when I was in rainbow. And I'm, you know, I, I took my majority at 20. So I took my majority 18 years ago. Well, so let me ask this then. You mentioned earlier that you basically, after the third degree, you can kind of go different directions. You don't necessarily progress in sequence for the degrees above no, that. And that, does that. Does that mean that like a 32nd degree is not necessarily considered more senior to a 31st not degree? Not really, no. Not really. Not especially, no. So what's the point? What are the different directions that one can go? You can go through the Knights Templar, which I know nothing about. You can go through the White Shrine of Jerusalem, which I know nothing about. You could go through, you go on up into like the Shriners and there's a bunch of other like weird stuff that goes in there. And then there's like blue lodges. There's, uh, there's different color codings for different lodges. It's just weird. Right. So you said the third degree is honorary. The 33rd degree is honor is the highest you can get. And how, and the 32nd degree is the Shriners. Yes. Yeah. And uh, what do you have to do to get bestowed the honorary 33rd degree? You have to work really hard. You have to memorize a lot of rituals. Yep. And how would one describe, like, what is the point of trying to advance up the degrees? 
I will say that from the brothers we've spoken to and from being an Eastern star, which also requires a lot of memorization and going through the Robert's rules of order and practicing it is that you learn a lot of interpersonal communication skills that you can carry on into your real life. One of the goals that we were told was that they want us to take these skills and apply them to our jobs and our families and make good people better or in a masonic case make good men better and it it's hard out there sometimes especially if you're shy or you weren't given the necessary skills in life and given an opportunity to learn how to speak to people and stretch your mind and i don't know if you know what robert's rules of orders are but if you yeah. want to go politics that's a really really good thing to know because then you sure you can but you could ahead. just take a but you could just take a course in Robert's well, you rule could. of orders you could, but it's also you get to make friends you get to meet people you did never meet like once I got to meet a woman two women one was 110 and one was 103 and they couldn't leave their houses and they had these like sisters that are like brothers that could like come and visit them when they you know had no family left right. it's like an extension of your family so I'll tell you what, since, since the Eastern Stars organization is what you're most familiar with, let me focus on that. So how is that, or does it, is it also organized into any levels or degrees at all? Well, yeah, I mean, there's different, like there's like Grand and there's the one after, and then there's like the one after Grand. You, you know, there's different, like there's a state level and there's like a national level. Well, no, I meant um, not like uh, organizationally speaking, but like degrees wise. We don't have degrees. Exactly. Not a, they're not called degrees in Eastern Star. What would you call them? Mm, levels? Yeah. You would call them levels. Yeah. yeah. Are because they comparable to what the Masons call degrees? They're similar, yeah. Mm. They're modeled but, after. But do you see what I mean? Like it's very hard to understand the whole it thing. It is hard to understand unless you've done it. Um, or if you have extensive experience in government. Yeah, it's like, you know, and there's a lot of weird conspiracy theories out there for Masons. No, we don't want to take over the world. No. 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 <laughs> okay, so let's see. I asked, why is it called a secret society? Okay, so you guys mentioned in the interview that we did on your channel that you guys are both, I think you said you're both non-religious. Yes. yes. Okay. But the thing I saw in the Freemasons said that you do have to believe in a God, but it doesn't matter which God. Now, I think you said here, it doesn't have to be a God, just a higher power. But honestly, when I hear talking to people talking about higher power, I think that's just like what Alcoholics Anonymous says so that they don't have to pretend that they're religious. Like, I mean, a higher power is God. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. In <laughs> for some people, but I mean, there are many, 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 many different types of gods. Yeah. Like, well, sure, but they're all, it's all transcend it's a, a transcendence yeah. kind of but, concept why is that necessary to be a part of these organizations what does it have to do with anything well i think that they just are going back to our historical roots thinking that it would be wholesome yeah i mean you can take and like i said you have to take an oath but you could take the oath against any holy book you wanted to yeah literally i mean we had a girl when i was in rainbow who took hers on the Torah. Yeah. I mean, that's a pretty common one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I've heard of them taking it on the Masonic Bible. I've heard of them taking it all kinds of stuff. But do you see what I mean when I say it? Like, uh, it, it can't just be about charity if it requires certain things in order to be a member. That's what makes people or me go, what's the point? There's got to be a point. There has to be some specific core purpose of the organization beyond being good people doing charitable work um you know learning um go gov proper governance uh but why can't that be the purpose of it but i think the purpose of it is too is to, it, it encourage here's here's something and i'm not going to say this comes from it teaches you how to live and knowing how to live you will know how to die what does that mean well it teaches you you know how to be a better person teaches you how to live a different type of life. Like I would say that our channel is very much a, a fraternal organization. So we've always ran it. That's the way it was be run. 
-hmm. and it teaches you, you know, how to be an upright citizen and, you know, not, you know, go create, go do a bunch of crimes. Yeah. Is uh, okay. Okay. Something just shifted a little bit. I could see the purpose of an an organization to be to essentially, I'm going to paraphrase, create model upstanding citizens. Is that how you guys think of it? Yeah. That's how most people will think of it. Not everybody, but most people will. Is that where the religious component comes in? Is that it's just the idea that you have to believe in something greater than yourself in order to what be moral? I would guess so. But you don't have to be religious. You just have to believe that there's something more out there. Like we believe in the universe Mm -hmm. and that's enough. They're like, oh, that's fine. Yeah, like our our higher power is the collective consciousness of the universe. Yeah. That's what we believe in. And they were fine. They were like, okay, cool, that's fine. And so, and so how, um, I know you, uh, forgive me if some of the information is just not sticking in my head. Um, you were, uh, you, uh, R- Rachel, you joined as a younger person. Rhea, you joined later? I joined as a younger person. Rhea did. She was younger. Oh, oh, oh. I was older. Uh, okay. So um, what got you to join when you were older? Okay. So in high school, I did not join because I, A, I had a job working as a server in a restaurant in a retirement living home. So I was already very busy and restaurants are also very close knit. So I already had that community aspect of close tight knit friends and a culture that I was a part of. I was also a varsity swimmer. So that meant that I was swimming two hours a day and also had a whole team that I was a part of. So to me in high school, that was already taken care of. I felt like I was surrounded by people that I could relate to and I was a part of something bigger than me. But then when I got older, I continued on in the restaurant industry and I got married. Not a good decision at 19. Don't do that. <laughs> For some people it works out, but very rarely. <laughs> and I got divorced and my long-term job that I had been a part of completely fell apart. And because restaurants have their own hierarchical, hierarchical, hierarchical orders or like, you know, like servers, bussers, managers, GMs, et cetera. And I mean, I knew everyone there and I had a family there basically. And when I had to leave that restaurant due to circumstances out of my control, I had nothing. I had no one. I had lost my husband and which I'm happy about now. And I had lost all my friends because they went with the job and I had nothing. And I became extremely depressed. And you turned to me and you said, can you help me? It was, it was like going through life without anyone. We're an interdependent species. We need other people. That's how we're hardwired. Whether, you know, some people don't like getting married. Some people don't like romance, but some people just prefer friendships, which is kind of like what we are. And, but I had no one. I had my daughter and I had her. And as much as I love them, that's not enough. You And so you came to me and you said, what would it take? And so we had to do a little research to find a mason for her. Mm-hmm. And we found somebody. It took us a couple days. I didn't need anybody because I was a member of Rainbow for so many years mm-hmm. that I didn't need anybody. All I had to do was call the lodge and be like, hey, can I come? You know. When well, you said me- find a mason for her, what does that mean? Well, you have to be related to a Mason or you have to have been in one of the junior organizations to to join. join. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. So then how'd you pull How'd you join them? We found a dead relative who was (laughs) that we didn't know about. Oh, (laughs) yeah. So, but what if you weren't able to find a relative? Well, there would have been no way to join. Maybe not. Maybe not. I don't know. I've never faced that. I've never faced it, so I wouldn't know. I don't know what people do. Okay. Is that specific to Eastern Star? Because I thought the Freemasons could recruit new members. Freemasons can. Okay. So it's different for the Eastern Star? It used to be back in the day. I remember when they changed the rule, actually, where people who'd been in Rainbow um, were facing the, I can't join Eastern Star. I can't join Eastern Star. And it became a problem. And when I was like 17 years old or maybe 16, they actually changed the rule that stated that you only had to be active in Rainbow, I think, for like three years. Before. Active means like you have to like have held an office and have been to like X amount of meetings. 
So they've got more restrictive rules for the women than the men. And I think they do an amaranth too. Yeah. I don't know much about amaranth. That's the other one. Like I really don't know a lot about it. I just know, I just know it's a thing. And I know it's called the Royal Court of Amaranth. That's all mm -hmm. I know. So not a very progressive organization. No. And they're working on that. Every single, every single uh, triennium, which is like every single year they have this like really big, like the, like the national one. And they're trying to get it changed so that anybody can join. And they're trying to get it changed. And has it, it barely passes. Every single year, it barely squeaks by that it doesn't pass. Mm -hmm. It barely does. Because the, old, the older generation, like the people you know, who are, you know, we'll say 60 and up, because really, you know, 60 and up, that's, they don't want that to change because it's what they're used to. Yeah. I mean, getting rainbow girls in there was almost impossible. Yeah. Well, and you're also free to leave whenever you want. And you can just be a member and you don't have to participate. Nope. You can do nothing like what we're doing right now. We're not participating at the moment we have in the past. We but probably will again. You can as much or as little as you want. And you're not required to show up. You're not required to do anything if you don't want to. So, so do you see it as being really particularly different than any other social club? I think or... in a, it's more like a fraternity is the way that our friend Kurt Johnson always talks about it. But in fraternities, too, there's like, you know, secrets and things that we don't know. I mean, I, we know several people in Eastern Star who are also in fraternities. Yeah. So it's not impossible that at the highest levels of Eastern Star, they are eating babies. I don't think they are. I don't think so. But it's not impossible. I mean, nothing's impossible. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, We're not saying that everyone should go become a Mason. Every single person should join uh, Eastern Star. I, I just don't think it's necessarily a bad thing to have or organizations and groups of people that work together to raise money and become better people. For a brief while, your daughter was a yes, Job's I, daughter, but we didn't, Job's daughters was like, why am I eating at McDonald's when I'm used to eating caviar at Rainbow? I hate, I absolutely hate Job's daughters. Like it's, <laughs> it was like, it was like, seriously, like even like a McDonald's, like the McDonald's parking lot when I've been used to eating caviar. Yeah. <laughs> so Rhea, if you were involved in the junior organizations, why, unless again, sorry, unless it's going in one year, not the other, how come you weren't involved in Eastern star? I, well, oh, that's oh. a good question. No, it's a good question. I wasn't in Eastern oh. star for a long time because when I married my abusive jerk of an ex, he didn't want anything to do with Masonic culture. And he's like, I will marry you, but you have to put away your Masonic culture. And I was like, okay, fine. I was fine with it at first. At first I was fine with it. And then I was like, okay, there's a lot of red flags here. Like as a dumb idiot, I shouldn't have gotten married. So then I got divorced and I got in contact with the Supreme Deputy of Iowa, whose name is Mary Danner. She is a very close friend of mine. She won't mind me answer, calling her about my name. She was like my mentor when I was a kid. And I sent her a message and I said, excuse me, Ms. Danner, could I come to, um, could I come to Grand Assembly, please? And she's like, oh, of course you can. Like, I'll be so happy to see you. And I was like, thank you. So then I fill all this paperwork out. And then I went to Grand Assembly down in Des Moines, Iowa, because there was never a jurisdiction in Minnesota. They were joined with Iowa because there wasn't enough assemblies. And I went down there and I had a really good time. And Mary Danner comes up to me at the end and she says, sweetie, did you have fun? And I was like, well, yeah, I did. Well, you should join Eastern Star. So I went home and I did some research and I started, you know, scrolling up things. And I started seeing all these familiar names of people that I hadn't seen in 30, 12, what have it, 15 years yeah. or so, 15, 16 years. And I called a bunch of lodges and I was like, could I join, please? Could I join? Could I join? And then we met Kurt Johnson, who kind of brought Rachel and I both in to Eastern Star. Mm -hmm. And Eastern Star meetings are held in the same lodges where the Masons are. Yes. Okay. So in Demolay, it's called a chapter. In Eastern Star, it's called a chapter. Or no. Yeah. It's called a lodge in Masonry. It's called a Bethel in Job's Daughters. It's called an assembly in Rainbow. So it gets very confusing. Why do they have to do that? <laughs> Wish they hadn't done that. We all get so confused. Like, what's happening? <laughs> Okay, so you're good now. You got everything? <laughs> yeah. 
Very confusing. So, but it seems like anyone who is, um, uh, nobody could ever reasonably confuse Scientology with something like Freemasonry. I mean, in fact, I know former Scientologists who are Freemasons, and I just never taken the opportunity to interview them about it. Hmm. Um, because, you know, in the videos that I saw today, even when I see some of the, the ritual stuff or the things that they wear or the symbology, I kind of go, eh, why? Why? What's wh why? Why? Just to be good people? Just to uh, like it. It seems like there's more to it. That, I mean, that's kind of where I'm going with it. Um, I mean, if it, I wouldn't downplay how hard it is to be a good people. No. And people oftentimes ask us, especially the two gentlemen that we mentor, and they're two of the sweetest I've ever met in my entire life. They wouldn't have the love that they have if they didn't have us, because we always talk about when they installed, there was a woman who was in charge of Rainbow. She was the mother advisor, and then there was a Rainbow dad. And there is a beautiful count, a beautiful passage in her in, in her installation that says, "Some of these women are not fortunate enough to have a mother, and it's your job to take on that role." And some of these gentlemen, who Rachel and I mentor, don't really have a family, yeah. and so we're like, "Okay, come join us. It's fine," mm -hmm. because you know, or there is like the Rose Lecture, which is like this beautiful tribute or a rose upon the altar. There, that's a Demole thing. And we'll get to Demolay in a minute. Um, and it was very beautiful that like I had all of this and I was able to kind of bring my Masonic background in to be like, okay, come with me. Like I can show you how to do this. And I think in a lot of ways, you know, in Rainbow, there are two crowns that every woman should wear. I disagree with one of them. That of a wife and that of a mother. A mother is not necessarily the woman who gave birth to you. There is a little girl in that other room who is my niece. And as far as I'm concerned, she's my daughter. Yes. And I wouldn't have that ability to be there for her in the same way that I do if I hadn't been in Rainbow when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And I, I know that your life hasn't been easy, Erin. I know that. Uh, I don't know everything that you've been through. And I can only imagine it. But personally, I... I have a 16 year old daughter who's autistic and has a speech language disorder, which is extremely isolating. And then getting divorced on top of that, it's, you know, you try to make friends and then they hear her yickety yak in, in her own language and they don't want anything to do with you. Or you go to the store and they're like, can you shut her up? Can you, and it's, you just keep closing in on yourself even more and other parents don't understand. And Eastern Star gave me an opportunity to get sympathetic people in to help support me because that's their platform. And then also help support my daughter too. When we just literally had, we had no one because we were just rejected by society because people don't understand autism. They don't understand what it's like to be a single parent sometimes. And it's, we were in a really bad spot, just emotionally too. And oh. it, it, the world could be a really shitty place. I will say this. A lot of people who are in Eastern Star and Masonry and whatever else are teachers. Those two things go hand in hand with each other. Like, because they're so like loving and so motherly and inside. <laughs> One of the most important people in my life, she was a lot younger than I am. And I say was because her name was Beth. And Beth, honey, I miss you every single day. And she died of sepsis several years ago. And she was quite a, she was probably about your age. Yeah. And she was I'm in her 27. 20s. And she had this big dream. And Beth, this is for you because I miss you every single day. And she was a grand officer with me. And she was like my little shadow. And every time I was a grand officer, she would be the grand, the same grand the next year. And I hadn't spoken to her in a long time. And I reconnected with her on Facebook. And she was a teacher and her dream was to be a mom while well, her widow or her husband, her husband, I'm not going to give his name because I don't want to, um, said that Beth had this infectious laugh and infectious love. And she loved everyone who crossed her path. And she was a teacher because of that love. And it's hard to talk about her because I miss her so much. Yeah. Then my demo, then I joined, then I joined the demo lake advisors. 
before, right before COVID hit, which is the young men's organization. They did not used to allow women to be advisors for men, but they changed that rule as well. See, all these rules have changed over time and they've expanded it and expanded it and expanded it. And um, I was talking to, some, to a guy that I've known most of my life. His name is Sean. I'm not going to give his last name because I don't think we need to. Sean, I love you if you're watching this by some chance. I'm going to show it to you anyways. Um, and I used to have this best friend. Okay. Part of why I kind of got isolated from Able 2 is because of her. And she and I went our separate ways. Um, I prefer not to say her name. And I was digging online one day for information about her family. And her brother had passed away nine years to the date that I had found that. And he was younger than her. And I joined um, Demolay to be an advisor in honor of him. And it's really funny because I walked through the door and Sean gives me this big hug and he says, Rhea, I miss you so much. Like I remember when you were, you know, really mm -hmm. when we were both young together. And I was like, yeah, me too. And he says, how's this person? And I was like, oh God, he's dead. What happened? Yeah. I don't know. So I joined DMLA to kind of honor him. But then I decided I didn't want to do it anymore because I had too many other things going on. Yeah. So it sounds like for you guys, it's more about the community than anything else. Yeah. For us, yes. For us. I mean, for if you were talking to Kurt, Kurt Johnson and Sherry Ann Davis Johnson, they might say something different. The community thing, I think, is easy to understand. And it might be that any organization, no matter how... Um, uh, unique or secretive or whatever. I mean, I think it's probably true for Scientology that a lot of the people who stay in Scientology do for the community. Now there's a different dynamic there because, you know, they also shun anyone who leaves. But is that in your experience true for any of these, uh, well, Freemason or the, the uh, affiliated organizations? How do they treat non, non members or, for, or former members? Well, they, I mean, there's a lot of, there's people who have what's called a legacy membership. And this is really important because yes, there are dues every single year. No, I'm not going to know how much they are. I'm not going to do a recruiting pitch because I don't care. Um, but every single year, there are people who, you know, have legacy memberships. which means the lodge actually pays yeah. for their membership or a temple in some places it's called a temple. I can't forget that. I have to go back and forth between the various jargon and the various parts of the country. Well, yeah. And like mm -hmm. I was saying earlier, you can leave, you can come back as many times as you want. You can be a active participant or an inactive participant. And she was in rainbow when she was younger and then took a long, many years hiatus from anything Masonic and they welcomed you back. With, I've never been felt more welcome. It's just that life took us down a different path. I never expected to be sitting here as a YouTuber. I mean, I never really expected that, but in a strange way, I think that if I hadn't gone through everything I've been through, um, I think that that would be something that I would not be able to do. When we worked, when we reached a thousand subscribers, we had a live over on our channel. You guys can watch it whenever you want um, about questions. And one of the questions we were asked was, you remember what my answer was? I do. What was it? If you could have dinner with three people living or dead, who would they be and why? And first on the list has to be Reverend Sexton because Reverend Sexton shaped not only my life, my life, but your life, Emma's life. You know, the two gentlemen who are like my brothers, like yep. those two guys, Emma's life is, is shaped by it. And without Reverend Sexton, there'd be a big re and Rachel hole in this world. There would be. We wouldn't be here having this conversation right now. I'll tell you that. Well, that makes sense. I can see why it's important to the both of you. And uh, community means a lot. It does. And I know what you mean earlier when you said, don't underestimate how hard it is to be a good person. I know what I know what you mean by that. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Well, I appreciate you guys explaining some of this to me as hard as it is for me to understand. I don't claim to have understood everything that you've said. <laughs> That's OK. But but, um, uh, but but it's the most I've ever spoken with anybody about the subject, and I think I've retained at least some of it. Is there anything else very specifically that uh, you wanted to say that didn't get a chance to? If you have any questions on it, you anyone can ask us. We have an open door policy. Reach out to us. And if we can't answer the question, we will send you to someone who can. We have a lot from all over the world. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So I'll put a link to your channel in the description. It's the Gala Sisters, and the name... Um, I'm looking at the interview that we did last week. The name of it is 
the dark secrets of Scientology exposed by Aaron Smith Levin. Spill the coffee. And uh, anyway, we had a really great chat, I thought. So anyone who's uh, a fan of the content that I put out on my channel, check out the one-hour interview that I did with uh, the Gala sisters on their channel. All right, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And uh, I'll talk to you soon. Bye, everyone. Bye.